Live stream has begun, Sergeant Hannah. Uh, Hannah, I need to uh, do the PC recording. Uh, I need you to take off the cloud. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you good, Izzy? You're on mute. Yes, shall I begin? Yes. <clears throat> good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or off. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's council, I mean, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Mr. Chair, I hand it to you whenever you're ready. And one second. Great. Uh, thank you all for joining our virtual hearing today on TLC response to COVID-19 and driver assisting programs and three pieces of legislation intro 18, pre-consider intro and resolution number 98 First, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedure items. Thank you. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which time you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the administration. First, from the Taxi and Limousine Commission, Chair Aloysia Radia Jarmashuk, and from DOT, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, and Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations, Joshua Benson. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and the chair or I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. And if you don't mind, before I continue, can you also please the real the council member who are already with us? At this time, we've been joined by council members Diaz, Ku, Minchaka, Deutsch, Reynoso, and Holden. Great. Good afternoon. And everyone, today the Committee of Transportation convenes remotely to hold a hearing on the following uh, oversight topic, TLC response to COVID-19 and the driver assistance programs. In addition, we will be hearing three pieces of legislation, which I will refer later on. In the past month, our life has dramatic, dramatically changed, as everyone knows. Work, for many has changed significantly with large numbers of people working remotely. Although for some, remote work is not an option, has not been an option. For those, it is not. Our four hired drivers, including taxi cabs, Libre, green car, block car, and four hired vehicle drivers do not have the luxury to work at home. The job trans transporting people to and from their homes, the jobs, medical appointments, and to visit their family and friends is vital to the economy function of our city. Before the pandemic, the TLC drivers faced many challenges, and the pandemic has only magnified these challenges. Average daily trip numbers from yellow taxi street hail livery and high volume for higher vehicles declined by 84% in 
of the pre-COVID levels by the beginning of April. Only 26% of all drivers were still operating and weekly earnings from those still in operation dropped by 49%. As a month has gone, has gone by, drivers' trip numbers and drivers' earnings have steadily risen. As of the end of June, the latest data TLC has released, trip numbers were still down 71% compared to June 2019. The industry is rebounding, but we cannot stop there. We need to ensure that TLC is effectively providing resources, services, and information to drivers. And of course, this is more than an agency. This is about OMB. This is about uh, the administration. At today's hearing, we hope to hear testimony from TLC and the industry regarding the effectiveness of resources to assist TLC drivers. This includes the TLC Driver Resources Center created by council legislation, the TLC Food Delivery Program created in response to the pandemic. We also hope to hear from TLC about the health and safety guidance it is providing to drivers and riders, including resources offered by other industries and stakeholders. As we will eventually put this virus behind us, we also want to use this hearing to question TLC regarding its plan for the future and how they will ensure that drivers and vehicle owners can operate safely and effectively. In addition to this important oversight topic, we will be hearing intro number 18 introduced by Council Member Cabrera, which is a local law allowing for high vehicles to operate with an initial 30 days inspection grace period. We will also hear two bills I have introduced, a pre-considered intro which will suspend monetary liability for parking violation issued to essential workers from the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic through September 30, 2020. I know that there will be probably some pushback from the administration in that, and some of them will be addressed issue related on Vision Zero. I would not compromise anything related to Vision Zero. Second, I know that there can be concern about we need to raise revenue. Well, if we will be in the same financial situation that we were before the pandemic, this with a budget similar to the executive one that the mayor proposed of $99 billion in state 87, similar to the one that we have in 2011, then I will understand that we can we have different other way on how to help drivers. We need to continue fighting so Washington DC provide the financial support to the city. And hopefully there's gonna be a change in DC and we will have a friend of the city of New York who will help us to balance the deficit. But right now we need to use the tools that we control in order to help drivers. Resolution number 98, which calls on the New York state legislation and governor to adopt legislation, making it a felony to assault a TLC licensed drivers. Drivers is also included in this hearing today. I will now call on the council member. I'm sorry, I think that Councilman Cabrera doesn't have the opening statement. It, it, and of course, if he, when he would like, he can say anything on his bill. Uh, I would like to, uh, sorry, the acknowledgement already been done. I will now have our moderator and committee council call on the administration to testify and to administer the off. Before I call on the administration, we have also been joined by council members Cohen, Levine, and Richards. Um, I will now call on the following members of the administration. Uh, Chair of the Taxi and Limousine Commission, Aloysia Aradia Jarmashuk. DOT Assistant Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zach, and DOT Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations, Joshua Benson. I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each individual to confirm their response for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? 
Chair Reddy Ajarmashar. I do, yes. Assistant Commissioner Zach. Yes. Deputy Commissioner Benson. I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Aloisi Heredia Jarmashuk, Commissioner of the Chair and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you about TLC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the support that we offered licensees uh, and the industry. New York City has changed uh, since the last time I sat before you in early March to testify about TLC's budget and our short and long-term goals. However, one thing that has not changed is our agency's commitment to the health and well-being of all New Yorkers. Well, uh, uh, our sorry, the, the health and well-being uh, of of all of our uh, licensees and the passengers that we serve. Despite the challenges that all New Yorkers have faced since March, I feel fortunate to share that we have maintained critical agency services while creating new opportunities for drivers to help New Yorkers in need. Before I go into greater detail about the TLC's response to COVID-19, I want to remember the tragic deaths of TLC drivers over the past few months. We are aware of more than 50 drivers who have passed away during this time and we're terribly saddened to hear of those losses in our community. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge a staff member of ours from the Licensing and Standards Office, David Louis, who also passed away from COVID-19 in April. He was a, a young man uh, and very committed, uh, a very committed and, and dedicated public servant. Uh, and we're incredibly sorry for his loss. The Taxi and Limousine Commission has remained fully operational during the COVID-19 pandemic, offering services to current and prospective licensees without interruption since March. We never stopped working or serving the city, and we are proud that we were able to do so while having many of our staff work from home. Our licensing and vehicle inspection facilities and staff continue to serve drivers throughout the worst of the crisis, with over 50,000 vehicles inspected since March and over 400 vehicle licensed during this time. It was, it was and is imperative to TLC that we continue keeping the public safe by making sure TLC licensed vehicles meet our rig rigorous safety standards. Our uniformed officers and many of our office staff were redeployed to staff food distribution sites across the city to deliver critical PPE to those in need and to assist the sheriff's office in keeping the city safe by ensuring that out of town visitors took measures to safely quarantine and protect New Yorkers. And throughout this time, our call center and external affairs teams continue to speak with drivers, answer their questions and make them aware of critical COVID services and benefits to help them and their families. In March, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit New York City, we were acutely aware of the toll this would take on our licensees who depend on consistent flow of tourists, business travelers, and busy New Yorkers to make ends meet. We also knew that thousands of New Yorkers were being impacted by job loss, furlough, and economic slowdown, with elderly and in immunocompromised residents struggling to safely leave their homes to purchase food or medicine. I knew TLC licensed drivers could help bridge this gap, an idea which turned into a massive food delivery program developed in partnership with the Departments of Sanitation, Parks and Recreation, Information Technology and Telecommunications, and of course, New York City Emergency Management. This program helped, near, helped nearly 10,000 TLC licensed drivers earn a total of $39 million while, while feeding thousands of New Yorkers at the same time. We have heard from our licensees that they are extremely grateful, not only for the opportunity to earn some money during this trying time, but to also serve their city and fellow residents. I am grateful for and proud of the TLC uniformed officers who have staffed the food sites every day for the past seven months, and the TLC staff from literally every division of the agency who helped run the sites by doing everything from assisting drivers use the new city-designed delivery app 
to loading boxes into vehicles as they were being dispatched to those in need. We knew that the food delivery program could not be a panacea for the struggles of TLC licensed drivers and owners during this tough time. And we worked to provide access to a number of other resources. Before the pandemic hit New York, TLC was planning to launch an in-person driver resource center in Queens. Once it became apparent that it would not be safe to serve large numbers of drivers and owners in person, we quickly moved to provide remote online and phone-based assistance to drivers and owners in need. Since the remote launch in March, in May, we have served over 600 drivers, which includes pairing close to 350 medallion owners with outstanding loans to financial counseling and legal services, as well as connecting them with available city and state benefits to help pay with payments for food and utilities. As soon as it is safe to do so, we plan to launch our in-person center. Of course, helping owners with debt requires cooperation from the lenders, and some of them are working with medallion owners. One lender has resolved tens of millions in outstanding unpaid loan amounts associated with 518 medallions, which has resulted in debt forgiveness of over $70 million. This lender has also reduced monthly payments by an average of over $1,000 per month. Many lenders have offered loan payment holidays during the COVID-19 pandemic, but borrowers will need extended relief as they try to get back to making regular payments and trying to make the backlog of deferred payments. Unfortunately, we are hearing reports that some lenders have ended ho uh, payment holidays, referred owners to collection agencies, and begun court proceedings against borrowers who have fallen behind in payments. While the city does not regulate the lenders, we can say that taking action against borrowers in the middle of a global pandemic is unhelpful and may harm the medallion market. Even with the tremendous disruption that the city has experienced, I have been able to learn a remarkable amount through frequent communication with drivers, owners, and businesses that we license. Since my tenure as commissioner began in February, I have personally met with and spoken nearly every day to drivers, medallion owners, and other industry stakeholders about their ideas and concerns. It is my goal to be accessible to any TLC licensee, both during this pandemic and afterwards. We have also provided a wealth of information to our licensees regarding health and safety tips and policies developed in consultation with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, reminding drivers to wear masks and clean their vehicles frequently, sharing COVID testing details and offering updates on COVID specific agency policies, such as the new option for FHV owners to install temporary partitions or place their vehicle licenses in storage. Besides our own policies, we have shared information on a number of local and state resources that may be beneficial to our drivers. Unemployment benefits, food assistance and public benefits, legal services, housing and eviction, prevention assistance, and much more. And of course, this work will continue because the pandemic is not over. But our hardworking licensees will continue to serve our city in many ways, and they deserve our support. I would like to speak briefly about what the TLC has planned for the future. The COVID-19 pandemic remains a very real threat to our drivers, both in terms of the public health impact and the economic impact. As the city continues to reopen, the TLC will need to think creatively about how to help the industries we regulate adjust to this new normal. We will work to help drivers transition from the food delivery program back to driving passengers. We are also well underway with our 90 day review of the agents of agency performance and processes, and we will have more to share in the near future about our findings. As part of this review, we will be working to become an even more client oriented agency, notably in regards to interactions between our licensees and TLC enforcement. Staff who have been working remotely since March have begun returning to our offices in a staggered and safe manner allowing us to continue serving licensees in the public. We hope to open the physical location of our driver resource center in Long Island City as soon as possible. And we will continue meeting with drivers and other licensees to learn from their lived experience and work to develop policies that better serve them. Finally, I would like to discuss the legislative items on the agenda today. Intro 18 of 2018, pre-considered intro 
T20206751 and Resolution 98 of 2018. First, intro 18 of 2018 would allow any TLC license for hire vehicle to operate for up to 30 days prior to an initial inspection, provided that passengers in the vehicle are informed that the vehicle has not been inspected by TLC. Safety is one of the core values of the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And we are in discussions with the bill sponsor and, and look forward um, to, to uh, a meeting of the minds. We are committed to working with bases and vehicle owners to ensure the quickest possible inspection process. And we look forward to working with the bill sponsors on this important issue. Second, pre-considered intro T2020-6751 would suspend mon monetary liability for parking violations issued to essential workers. While we can only speak to the part of this bill that impacts TLC licensed drivers, we do want to mention that many of these drivers are covered under a traffic rule recently promulgated by DOT that exempts drivers and vehicles delivering free meals to participants in the New York City Emergency Management TLC Temporary Emergency Food Delivery Program from parking and standing rules for a period of up to 20 minutes. With respect to the safety impacts of the legislation, we defer, will defer to our colleagues at the Department of Transportation. Lastly, Resolution 98 of 2018 calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation making it a felony to assault a driver licensed by the TLC. Although in most cases, a person who assaults a driver can be charged with a felony, the resolution supports legislation that would make it an automatic felony to assault a driver, similar to assault of, of a New York City bus driver. TLC licensed drivers perform an essential transportation service and are often vulnerable because of their work. And that is why we're deepening our cooperation with the NYPD to ensure drivers are able to provide critical information so that in investigations can begin quickly uh, and that drivers have access to the available resources. We have issued guidance to drivers on how, we, on how we are reporting assaults, and we encourage drivers to call 911 if they ever experience this horrible crime. We have observed that many driver assaults have occurred dur during the course of an unlicensed trip, either involving an unlicensed driver or vehicle or involving passenger solicitation without a trip sent by a TLC licensed base. I continue to encourage drivers to never take an illegal street hail both as a way of protecting the public and upholding the TLC rules, and also as a way to keep them safe, themselves safe. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about TLC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have for us. So uh, what is the position? I know that the team from DOT are also joining you when it comes to that bill uh, that is aiming to provide amnesty uh, for the period of time of the coronavirus for those drivers that have some pending parking violation. So I, I will defer to my colleagues at, at uh, the DOT. Elliot, you. would you like us to read our testimony and then we'll take questions? I'm not quite sure, are we? Chair, would you like DOT to read their testimony in the bill first? I, I can begin the testimony, sure. Uh, I'm ready if you okay. are. Um, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the, of the committee. I am Joshua Benson, Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations at the New York City Department of Transportation, and I am joined by Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the administration on the chair's pre-considered intro. COVID-19 has changed our lives and our city in ways that were unimaginable only a few months ago. As Commissioner Trottenberg has previously testified, together with our sister agencies, DOT has worked tirelessly to continue managing the city's vital transportation infrastructure responsibly, safely, and creatively for this ongoing crisis. 
all while following health guidance and maintaining essential functions. Throughout this challenging time, we have remained committed to supporting essential workers, equity, and the areas hit hardest by COVID-19. Since the start of the pandemic, <clears throat> we have aimed to provide essential workers safe options for traveling to work. We have worked with the MTA to implement a record bus lane expansion. We have expanded the city's bike lane network and brought City Bike to new communities and even worked to get donated bikes into the hands of hospital employees. And City Bike has provided over 19,000 critical workers with nearly 700,000 free City Bike trips to date. For some people, driving during this time remained the best option, a preference or a necessity, but everyone must continue to follow all of our traffic rules so that we can keep New Yorkers safe keep emergency vehicles, buses, trucks, and other traffic moving, and keep our curbs clear for needed business activity. Our roads are a shared public resource and the rules are there to make the system work and support Vision Zero. <clears throat> During the height of the health emergency, the mayor recognized the need for many healthcare workers who are laboring under extraordinary conditions during a variety of shifts to have access to parking near their hospitals and clinics. And DOT worked with Health and Hospitals, the Greater New York Hospital Association and other organizations to distribute over 14,000 permits for workers at close to 60 different hospitals across the city. Now, turning to Chair Rodriguez's proposed bill, while DOT is always happy to discuss ideas for legislation, this bill would effectively preempt an extremely broad category of New York City residents and visitors from nearly all parking violations anytime during the covered period anywhere in the city, with the exception of hydrants, bus stops, and bus lanes. This legislation raises significant uh, problems for Region Zero and the city's other transportation goals. We strongly agree with the focus on supporting our heroic essential workers. And we are proud of our work together with our partners to provide travel options and support bus, bike, or car trips through priority treatments, subsidized trips, or parking permits. However, the city's ability to enforce parking violations remains essential for managing our streets, even, and in some cases, especially amidst the crisis we've been experiencing. All street users, including essential workers themselves, whatever their mode, rely on enforcement of our parking rules for everyone's safety and to maintain access for all. Drivers who park illegally cause a multitude of problems and threaten the safety of all street users. They can obstruct crosswalks and pedestrian ramps. They can block our daylighting efforts, reducing visibility for both pedestrians and drivers or interfere with safe roadway geometry. And when double parked, they can cause congestion, block bike lanes, forcing cyclists to enter traffic to move around them. These violations, unfortunately, can have deadly consequences. <clears throat> In June, we lost 38-year-old cyclist Jose Luis Estudio Garcia, an essential worker on his way home from his job <clears throat> at a restaurant serving employees at several nearby hospitals, who was killed while trying to maneuver around a double parked vehicle on Park Avenue in the Bronx. <clears throat> Moreover, violating meter regulations or loading zone restrictions creates increased congestion as drivers are forced to search longer for parking as well as leading to more of the kind of unsafe double parking that I mentioned. To mitigate these impacts, we must continue enforcing parking regulations. This is the only way we can maintain critical safety regulations, effectively allow for loading and unloading of essential goods and passengers, create parking availability and shopping in business areas, and prioritize parking for people with disabilities. In conclusion, we at DOT will continue working with the council and our partners to support essential workers and creatively respond to this, this unprecedented and challenging time for our city. And always look forward to further discussion. At the same time, we want to emphasize how important it continues to be for all drivers to comply with parking regulations so we can safely and effectively manage our streets. <clears throat> and therefore, DOT has significant concerns with this legislation. 
thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We have also been joined by council members Cabrera and Rose. Look, I, I'm happy to be working with uh, the administration, the OT commissioner and you guys, part of the team. But this is not, this is not, this is not about the good on the back a, a cap. This is about, you know, a, a how can we look on what happened during the pandemic? We are not talking about changing or, or reducing the, the enforcement for anyone that violates our parking regulation. And I get from the administration point of view, a concern is not just about safety because I can tell you no one will be carrying more safety and especially vision zero than myself. So this is about what happened during the coronavirus. Uh, oh, uh, are they, you know, is there a possibility that we can provide an amnesty not to, not to incentivize anyone to violate or to change the culture uh, that we are developing our city to make our city more pro pedestrian and cyclist. So this is about, you know, a, a, a area where I feel that they were essential workers, uh, that they were going to hospital, going to clinic. And at some point there were so many, you know, the city was not moving at all. In, in many areas where we have all those parking signs. And I think that if, if we look, and again, as I said, you know, I, we also know that, uh, that we are operating a deficit in our city and we have to continue raising revenue. But this is about how can we work to provide an amnesty, amnesty, not to include any driver who park in a bus lane not to include to any driver who park close in the fight in, in front of fire drive. So let me ask you, how many tickets are pending for parking violation during the time of coronavirus, especially from February, from March to September right now? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, the in terms of just the, the raw number of violations, um, I'm, I'm just looking through my notes here. I believe um, it's, it's approximately um, 2 million uh, 800,000 parking uh, summons is issued from March 13th to September 30th. Is that what does it represent in dollars if we look at an average? Uh, I'm not sure of, of the, the the dollar amount. And, and and when you say pending, I'm not really sure. You know, these this is just the number that were issued. So um, some of them may have been been uh, adjudicated or, or or paid already. Okay. Look, I have a lot of respect for the work that you do in your division for the work, you know, that we've been doing to continue making our city uh, safe. So as working with you and also working with the advocate group, TA and others, we know that I can say that we've been so lucky to find uh, different partners, including you saw TA also at the council. And, and so for me, I know in a no moment means reducing, you know, a, a, the level of enforcement that we need to maintain when you want to violate any parking rule. So I, and I also get it from the administration point of view, also the need that we have to have a plan to continue raising revenue. So I, is, I you know, I, I understand what, you know, what you have explained. I is like for us to leave the window open to continue looking in and see how, you know, a, a, a Knowing that from the beginning, we can we are seeing different approach now to look at the situation. But for me, this is about can we provide some, you know, relief for any first first responder for anyone that they were working during those period of time that they didn't have any other choice and more than part, you know, close to a hospital, close to an area 
and that was critical during that period of time. So if we can, you know, at least look at more details, like how many of those violation tickets are pending, you know, where did those violations happen? So that probably could be something that I would like to put on the table and see how you feel about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and we appreciate working with you, of course, and, and you know, the, the good work we've been able to do together. And, you know, um, it was nice seeing you last week um, to launch the 149th Street bus lane in the Bronx. And, um, you know, I think from the DOT perspective, we're not really looking at the, the dollar amount of this. We're just looking at, you know, the, the totality of uh, essential workers and how they get to work and, and balancing that. And, um, you know, many of them, as you know, are taking transit or biking. And so I think um, the con we have a concern about sending a message out that um, it's okay to violate parking regulations because that would be, um, that would work against uh, many of the other essential workers who, who are um, in fact, you know, counting on us to, to enforce those regulations so they can get to work safely and on time. Um, but I do think, as you mentioned, it makes sense to look a little more into the data and see, um, you know, what a little more, get a little more nuance of what's going on here because I don't think, um, this, the, the 2,800,000 number is not representative of, of the category necessarily that, um, that you're talking about. Um, but, but again, I mean, it just like we, we, um, we always take our first perspective on things through the lens of safety and, and that's really where we're coming at it from. And, and um, you know, that's why um, we mentioned um, the, the unfortunate, um, crash in, in June involving the cyclist um, who, who was uh, trying to avoid a, an illegally double parked vehicle. And, you know, those are the kinds of situations that they keep us up at night and we don't want to um, encourage that type of, of, of issue to happen again. But, but Chairman, I'll just say, we wanted to make sure that you heard from us today. We know this was, was it, this was added kind of last minute, but we know that, that this was important for you to, to hear from us, but we're always happy to to, as, to, to keep talking as this moves forward. There's obviously a lot of agencies also to also uh, coordinate with since in terms of like the details of the summonses and what's pending. Thank you, no, I agree. I just want to be clear, first of all, that, you know, for the record of anyone, especially those who that we've been working and making a lot of progress on Vision Zero, ones that we are not sending the message that we want to, a, 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 is a, for anyone to believe that we are trying to encourage drivers to violate any parking rules. We want to continue for us. And, and if we can work on helping the first responder, especially during the period of time where they were, and, and again, I'm, we are not aiming or trying to have a conversation about let's bring permanent changes to this rule. We are trying to look on in which area can we alleviate you know, the condition, the situation of anyone that working during that period of time can have an honesty for any day that they have pending. But as you said, there's different, off is involved, a, a traffic is involved. So it, I'm more than happy that we continue looking at, but again, for the many women, you know, especially advocating for, to make the city more safety for pedestrians and cyclists, and no mean women to say, you know, we want to do something that affects the first responder. We want to hold the first responder and we don't want to again, bring any permanent changes. Absolutely, and I think that's why we're so proud of the permits that we were able to issue so quickly um, in those early days to get them so they, they could get to work as quickly as possible. But absolutely, we know that safety is has been the hallmark of, of your uh, time in the council. So we're, we're right there with you and we're happy to keep continue talking. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Now going back to, to uh, the, our TLC commissioner, and, and you always have been a great honor to be working with you. And, and, but also we know that the agency also, the fact that is working also on trying to help the drivers, also, you know, everyone has to deal with some cut in their budget. And, and I know that there was a lot of recommendations that we made as part of the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force that, that it, it had not been 
uh, follow up when it comes to the implementation because in many areas, you, you require financial commitment from City Hall. Uh, uh, so one of those, one of them, the one related to the driver resource center, uh, what, what can you, we expect when it comes to the possibility to uh, uh, opening a some percenters, uh, the services in a physical space for those drivers that don't have access to uh, do it remotely. So we are we are we are um, evaluating what the timeline will be to open the actual brick uh, and, and mortar building um, in Long Island City. I don't have a timeline uh, at this time. Uh, however, it was very important that we launch virtually. Uh, and if if a driver uh, does not have access um, to online resources, if they call our external affairs number and, and, and we share that number pretty regularly in our direct correspondences uh, to licensees, we can provide uh, assistance over the phone. You don't need uh, to have access to the internet to tap into the resources from uh, at the driver resource center. So anyone, uh, any driver or licensee that needs um, any types of uh, the supports that we're offering at the driver resource center whether it's mental health, health services or financial guidance or, or legal assistance, they can access those uh, via the telephone. We're happy to work with them uh, by phone to set up an appointment for that, for that type of engagement. So again, uh, we, we don't, you, know, you don't need or your driver does not need to have access to the internet um, to, to tap into the services. They are available for everyone um, uh, uh, online or by telephone. Right. Uh, Commissioner, what has uh, TLC been able to do to partner with drivers, representatives, advocate organization to maximize resources to provide information, benefit, and services to drivers? So we, we communicate pretty often, uh, either through monthly or weekly notices. Uh, we set up a website, uh, a COVID-19 website uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, which we uh, update pretty regularly, and there drivers can find out information about the Driver Resource Center, about New York State and federal unemployment benefits, food assistance, uh, public benefits applications, uh, information about our Driver Protection Unit, legal services, um, housing uh, and eviction prevention assistance, even voter registration um, and, and, and census information. So we, we have all of those online. All of our um, uh, all of our employees at the call center and at external affairs also have uh, access to all of this information to share with any licensee that calls by, by telephone. Uh, so we are uh, constantly um, communicating all of this information um, uh, to our drivers through every medium that we have available, including um, social media. Okay. And can you describe the own whole process that TLC license for Ohio vehicles can go through? What process, sorry? The on hold. Uh, oh, the, the, uh, the vehicle license, the storage. Yes, um, if any um, right now um, and, and during the pandemic, and I'm not sure when we will end this program, um, we are uh, making an allowance for, for drivers who are not operating their car for hire that would like to um, take advantage of, of um, not uh, of, of, of lowering their insurance expen expenses, they can um, put their vehicle license in storage. Um, at this time, the DMV is reopened, so they would have to surrender their, their plates. Uh, but they can they can put their vehicle license in storage without any cause for concern, and and come back to retrieve it when they're ready to to begin providing for hire transportation uh, for passengers. And how long do you think that that process will continue? That it, 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 it will continue. That program will continue being offered to. to um, those certainly, people. certainly through through the end of this year, um, I think. Uh, and we need to really evaluate. I haven't determined the date as, as of yet. Uh, we, I would like to see 
um, more passenger demand before we um, uh, eliminate uh, the program. So I haven't, I, we haven't made a decision just yet. Okay, I have other question, but I'm gonna be uh, giving the opportunity to Council Member Cabrera who also have joined us if he would like to say something about his bill and also to follow any question that he may have. Sure. Thank you. Chair, I think Council Member Cabrera had to leave the hearing. Okay. Is there any council member uh, ready to ask any question? Let's move on to give that opportunity. To me. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we'll now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Um, council member Reynoso will be first. Council member Reynoso. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner and uh, uh, Department of Transportation. Happy to see you here. Um, I, I want to ask just a couple of questions. I know it's been a, a tough time for taxi drivers because of the pandemic. I think we're, we, we've all suffered uh, uh, in the pandemic, and we're trying to be creative and thoughtful about how uh, we help people. Um, and one of the first things that TLC did uh, that I thought I was actually a fan of originally was the meal delivery. Um, but uh, initially I got some of the drivers that told me that they didn't think that that program would be successful. Um, can you give me some information or some data as to how many drivers participated and um, the amount of funding that came from the city to those drivers for that work? Well, yes, uh, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Um, and it's nice to see you. Nice to see you uh, we, thank you. We, uh, yes, this, this program was so important to me um, uh, and, and it was so critical for us to launch it. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, millions of New Yorkers who have food vulnerabilities and, and thousands of our drivers were, were out, of, out of work, especially yeah. when the city went into quarantine and, and they were out of work because there were no rides, there was no passenger demand, yeah. very little. Um, and they were, uh, I was afraid of how much uh, they would be struggling um, as a result. And so um, getting this program underway and making the delivery portion of it paid um, and exclusive only to TLC licensees was, was a huge um, uh, opportunity and a huge, I would say a huge win for us um, in, in, for the drivers. So we had about 20,000 drivers that registered um, and I see roughly about 10,000 to 11,000 participated. Um, and to date we've paid, the city has paid about $39.5 million in direct um, wages uh, to those drivers. So they have um, uh, had that opportunity to, to access supplemental income, not a replacement for their salaries, um, but some, something to bring home to put food on the table Quite, quite literally, um, and I'm very proud of the program. I'm very grateful for the drivers. Um, I would go out to the food sites at the height of the pandemic. Our drivers were delivering a million meals a day. Oh. I, I mean, if you think about delivering 50, 50, 50 million plus meals to people in need, um, uh, it's no small feat. And they are so selfless. I mean, they're really heroes. They are really, there's, there's no heroes and heroines. Um, there are a lot of men and women out there doing this, this delivery. Um, it's hard work, um, uh, but uh, you know, resounding, the resounding feedback is that they were proud to do the work. Um, uh, New Yorkers are gritty. They love giving back to their communities. Um, and, and I think that this was a, a huge success. Um, and, and I'm very grateful to the city uh, for providing um, this, um, the funding for this during during a pandemic and when the city was in a financial crisis, I know that um, it's it's not enough for everybody. But I think it was an example of how the city um, prioritizes our, our licensees and recognizes um, their their needs um, and that they contribute um, to the city and that they are part of the city. Um, and right. so I think this was important. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for that work as well. And I'm actually getting calls now from some of those members that 
uh, were skeptical in the beginning are now saying, we hope that this program doesn't get drawn down to zero. We, we, they, it was a lifeline for some of these drivers. So um, I understand that the need has changed since the beginning of the crisis, uh, but always keep in mind that uh, the, the TLC drivers seem to be ready to go um, uh, when you need them for, for these type of crises. So thank you for that. Um, look, I, I wanna be honest, uh, you become commissioner and then you're, you're dealt the hand of COVID um, immediately during that time. I don't think anyone wanted to be you or in your seat commissioner. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that it's with a grain of salt, the conversations we have and understanding that it's like crisis level management day one for you. And I really appreciate you you doing the best to, to take care of these drivers. I do, I, I got a couple of seconds. I wanna talk about Marblegate. Um, and really understand how, uh, if in any way, has Marblegate uh, assisted drivers? Because I think a big issue here is, of course, the financing and the mortgages and the loans that they have. Um, and we're, we're trying to be creative. Uh, we wouldn't- Thanks, Bart. Thank you, Sergeant, uh, just very quickly. Uh, the, it's the, the biggest issue that they have. Um, and now that the crisis exists, Unfortunately, unless we get a ton of cash coming from the federal government, I just don't see how we're going to be able to assist these drivers with a, a debt relief, which is what my ideal goal would be. But I want to be realistic and understanding the financial situation in the city is just not something that I can see immediately. So I just wanted to ask, Marblegate is supposed to be the middle ground, helping refinance a lot of these loans. How is that going? Can you just give me some statistics as to how many people they've helped um, so that if it's working, that we can, that we can ask more drivers to participate in this program. So I just want to understand if it's working or not. So if you could just give me a rundown. So the, the entity that you reference is one of uh, the many lenders um, in uh, that hold um, loans uh, for uh, medallion owners. Um, they specifically have, um, they have resolved or restructured um, loans for about 518 um, medallions. They've done about $70 million in, in debt forgiveness, and they've been able to reduce um, payments uh, for a, a fair amount of drivers, roughly average about $1,000 less uh, per month for, for a lot of their loan holders that, that were winning, willing uh, to work with them um, on restructurings. And restructurings are, are complicated. There, you know, there are down payments that need to be made. Um, however, in a climate like this, um, where at some point the holiday reprieve will end, um, anyone who can draw their loan down from you know from six hundred thousand to three hundred thousand, that's a significant um, uh, shift. Um, and they they are not the only lender that's done restructurings. We have a lot of um, uh, a lot of lenders who have been highly cooperative um, during this process, um, not hounding um, the the drivers or the, the owners on providing the holiday reprieve. Um, and, and our driver resource center, NILAG is, is the person, is the entity that's helping our drivers um, uh, with uh, legal and uh, uh, with the financial assistance or guidance. Um, they have been working you know, with about uh, 500 to 600 of our, our drivers to try to find um, ways to reduce um, their overhead and their, their expenses. And quite a, quite a number of, of the lenders have been um, really cooperative in restructuring uh, loans. And, and I think that, you know, if 518 um, medallion owners uh, were able to resolve 70 million, that's money back in their pockets for their families and money that they are not paying um, to a lender. Uh, and I know that this is complicated um, and that a lot of our drivers um, and, and a lot of us don't have favorable um, points of views uh, uh, towards the lenders, um, but the ones that are cooperative, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful for that partnership and we hope to see more of it. I, I, I compel all of the lenders to work with their borrowers to reduce um, their, their loan payments and to restructure where it's possible. Hey, thank you. Uh, before we, uh, Commissioner, before uh, going to the next uh, council member that has a question, I want to say in Spanish that I want to share with our people in Spanish that the audience of today we are realizing with the intention of listening again, the commissioner, someone who speaks English and Spanish perfectly, 
eh, que, que conoce nuestra comunidad también sobre cómo la ciudad eh, ha estado respondiendo durante la época del coronavirus, qué tipo de ayuda se le provee a los choferes, eh, cómo están funcionando los centros de, de, ayuda, de recursos para ayudar a los choferes también, algo que sabemos que no se ha estado corriendo, cómo se idealizó, cómo se va a hacer por la misma situación financiera también por la que está atravesando la ciudad. Pero lo más importante de que nosotros hoy lo que queremos conocer es de qué forma hemos estado ayudando a los taxistas, de qué forma todavía lo vamos a seguir ayudando mejor. Eh, una de las resoluciones que, tenemos, que estamos conociendo hoy es una resolución que pide de que a nivel del Estado se cambien las leyes que tienen que ver cuando un taxista es asaltado y que cuando esa ley, cuando un taxista es asaltado, que se, la categoría que se dé sea un felony para aumentar la, la, eh, eh, la consecuencia si de una persona que se atreva a saltar a trabajadores que demostraron durante época del coronavirus que son esenciales, que estuvieron trabajando moviendo a aquellas personas que iban de a su trabajo, que no tenían la opción de quedarse en la casa. Y una de las partes, la voy a hacer en español también, eh, también en inglés, tiene que ver con... Eh, el programa de la MTA de, de hacer partner para trabajar ofreciéndole la opción de transportación a los trabajadores esenciales durante la hora que los trenes están cerrados. Eh, una preocupación del principio que yo he tenido de que ese programa lo hicieron con los high value, eh, 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 including leave. So, ¿Cómo todavía hay oportunidad? para que a través de, de usted como la líder de la agencia se pueda lograr de que la MTA también incluya los partnerships, las bases locales libres que están en la comunidad para que ellos también puedan ser incluidos en proveer transportación durante las horas que los trenes están cerrados. I just wonder how TLC also can work with us to be sure that with the leadership of the commissioner, they also can talk to the MTA to expand the participation, not only of the high volume company that has been used by MTA to provide services during the time that the trains are not working from 12 to 6 a.m., but also to include delivery basis. So Commissioner, what, what do you think about, how do you see the partnership that the MTA have established with other high value uh, 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 company and what opportunity can be there to also fight to include liver bases as part of those used by MTA to provide alternative transportation during the time that the trains are not in service from 12 to 6 a.m. When the MTA um, set launched its program, and, and I think that they're not um, doing the program anymore, but I'm not sure of, of that, um, they they definitely reached out and they, they are, are a willing uh, partner and are always solicit our input, which I'm grateful for. When uh, at the height of the pandemic, when the trains went out of service overnight, I, as I'm aware, the MTA worked with Limesis that has access to um, a, a, a plethora or a variety of livery bases. They worked with, with Curb for yellow cabs. Um, and I think they worked with another company called CTG, but I would have to look at my notes to, to confirm that. Um, so it, it seemed to me that when they launched that service, which is independent of the TLC, um, that they uh, had a balance of the different uh, types of providers that were representative of the communities that the passengers live in. And the, the liberal basis was not part of that equation. And that's I something believe, that I see. Like, I, I believe that they... Yeah, sorry. As I, as I understand it, they, they offered the program to Limesis, which dispatches um, livery-based cars. I don't, I don't have access to the MTA's data to, to be able to speak from a place of certitude, um, how many were dispatched through those. But I, I do know that they contracted with, uh, with Curb, with Limesis, um, for livery-based dispatch cars and CTG. Okay, so let's follow, let's figure out this more information. Sure. And, and, and then also it is a, a, a concern that 
you know, that there's no services then provided, the MTA has suspended the services from 12 to 6 a.m. So everyone know that when we talk about essential workers, it's not only the doctors, the nurses or the technicians that they work at the hospital, it's the men and women, many of their own documents that they've been working at nine, that they came out at 12, they came out at one in the morning. So what we are saying is that there's no transportation right now provided to those individuals. Now let's go with the next council member that has a question. Do we have any other council members who would like to ask questions of the administration? Chair, sure, it doesn't look like we have any other questions at this time. Okay, so, so Commissioner, where do you think are we right now when it came to the sector that they are leasing, that they have license to lease vehicles? It, it, how many licenses do we have right now that they are under control of the leasing sector in New York City? Um, I will have to come back to you with that information. I, I don't know how many vehicle licenses are or are, are, are belong to um, uh, lessers. I, I don't actually have that information in front of me. I'm sorry. Do you, do, do you see as a problem when it comes to reality that, you know, that is happening that, you know, a new person that arrived in the city of New York that driving a taxi was the first a, a choice for them to get a job and it was very easy. I myself being one of those that bought my car together with my brother-in-law, work at night during the time that I was going to City College during the daytime. So right now, a person that arrived in New York City, they don't have the opportunity to get into that industry unless they go to the leasing company because they are the one that had the opportunity to have cars and with a plate and the plaque to be able to get someone driving as a liberated taxi drive, uh, driver. There, there's, there's definitely um, opportunity for anyone who wants to operate, become a TLC licensed driver to, to do that. We, we are able to license drivers. We, we um, appreciate and respect that a lot of our licensees and potential licensees are, are not uh, are, are come to this country or they come to the United States to work and that this is a viable opportunity. Um, and, and there are different ways to drive as a TLC licensed um, uh, driver. You can, um, you can lease a, a yellow taxi, you can lease a, a black car. Um, and if you have the resources to, you can, um, you can get a vehicle license for an energy efficient vehicle or for a wheelchair um, accessible vehicle. Um, and those uh, plates remain uh, available to anyone who, who would like to provide that service. So let, let's follow to see how we can also uh, push together to see how we can expand the incentive uh, when it comes to the electrical vehicle. It, 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 since that, those are the two areas that is still provide the opportunity for someone to go directly to TLC and not necessarily go into the, a, anyone that has a leasing company. Because even though I do believe that we have good actor of individual that they are leasing vehicle, there's other that they're not. And, 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 and someone that is leasing a car paying $350 a week, when we add those numbers, like by the time when that individual finished uh, the contract with that listing, they already have paid double the cost, the value of the car without being able to maintain the license. So I think that if we also can explore some way that, you know, even in some changes saying, even someone that started listening, by the time when he or she is ending that contract, we should be able to say, TLC should be work, work, able to work so that that person can get their own a license and plaque from the TLC and not necessarily paying the car 
without having the opportunity to maintain that plaque because that plaque doesn't belong to her or him. That plaque belongs to the leasing company. Or, I mean, any anyone who entered a, into a lease prior to 2018, there is a select group of people that are able to lease to own. Uh, but at this time, because we are not um, uh, uh, provisioning uh, new vehicle uh, plates, FHV plates, there, there really isn't, there is not an opportunity uh, for lease uh, to own. But similar to you, I am concerned about anyone who is taking advantage of our drivers. Um, that is, is not something um, that, that I want to see happen. Um, and it's, it's something that we should work together to ensure um, we, we eradicate and, and, and perhaps this is something that we can take on in, in the livery task force um, because we're, as we embark on that work. Okay, thank you. So from my end, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, uh, again, like the members of DOT uh, uh, for being here with us today. I think that this event being shorter than what we anticipated. And, uh, and, and also we'd like to invite everyone to also join the next hearing that we will have at the end of this month. Elio, if you can also share the date of the hearing, but the next one is gonna be about MOP. It's gonna be about, you know, how we need to learn from what happened and we rebel and, and what changes should we change, should we make and to anyone that would like to bring any type of MOP to the city of New York City. Uh, so uh, if we can share the date of the hearing, it would be great. And with that, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, DOT. And I, if any can share the day I don't have it in front of me right now, then we can adjourn the hearing after that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Chair, uh, that hearing has not been noticed at this time, but we'll share the date as soon as that takes place. Um, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Uh, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go-ahead to begin uh, after they set the timer please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Uh, I would like to now welcome our first panelist, uh, Beta Via Desai. Time starts now. Thank you. I'm actually testifying in front of Gracie Mansion where many drivers have gathered to protest the lack of action by the city on debt forgiveness. I have to respond and say what Marble Gate has put together is not a program. It is an offer for debt forgiveness at $300,000. You have to pay $25,000 cash up front, $1,700 monthly mortgage. This is not sustainable. It is not a resolution. This is an offer that many people who are feeling desperate may be entering into, but shame on any member of this city that thinks that that is somehow a resolution. This is such a serious crisis. The city has known about it, not just for weeks or months, but for years now. Meanwhile, we have a proposal on the table. If the city can offer that for any loan that is reduced to $125,000, the city can act as a backstop where if that loan is defaulted and the medallion is foreclosed on, the city would place a minimum bid at a public auction equal to whatever is the balance of the loan at that time or foreclosure. The city does not have to pay for it if somebody else bids higher. If the city does end up purchasing it, they can still go ahead and resell it. We have put together a financial model, a financial model that is interactive, where you can play with the different components. We're asking the city, please city council, hear us. With the no one in the administration is listening to us. We're talking about at least 6,000 families. If owner drivers are not allowed to continue in this industry, this yellow cap sector is not going to survive. 
this is a dire matter. Please try, stop trying to put a Mickey Mouse band. Time expired. That's what you've been doing up to now. Listen to us. Call on the controller to at least vet our proposal. It is sound. It is low risk and low cost to the city of New York City Council. We need you because the administration will not listen to us. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this panelist? Uh, well, I just got to say that, that uh, as you know, I'm committed to work with you and all the brothers and sisters who are part of those, uh, of those 6,000 individual medallion owners and the drivers. So whatever we can continue, you know, partners, uh, establishing partnership, we would do it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, was, I, I didn't get back to you uh, uh, before, but we are here ready to continue working with the whole community of the Taxis Alliance and see how we can work. Uh, I have expressed to City Hall that I understand that uh, uh, the need uh, to help them, I think that we need to bring together a plan that can work. And I feel that, you know, we understand it that we are going through this financial crisis. We also need to be sure that we are creating on how we can work to help those uh, men and women that they owe a lot of money because of the way of how uh, the medallion was sold to them in the past for a million dollars, $700,000, and the body went down. So more than happy to continue working again with the Taxes Alliance, with the administration to see how we can help them. Could we unmute B2B? Thank you. Chairman Rodriguez, we have a proposal. The city just needs to vet it. Please ask the controller, ask the office of management and budget to vet our proposal. At most, it will cost $75 million over 20 years. The taxi cab improvement surcharge fund alone, according to the controller, as of February 2020, had a $50 million surplus. We understand there is a crisis across the city. We're not seeking a special treatment. We're asking you to recognize a deep crisis that you know has unfolded under the city's watch and much of it because of the city's own actions. Our proposal is low cost and the money is separately there for our solution. Ask the controller to vet our proposal, sir. That's what we need. Let's continue. Let's let's continue again. Let's get some time. I promise you, if we don't talk today, let's talk tomorrow and see how we continue strategizing together. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this panelist? Okay. Um, I, I would also like to announce that uh, members of the public will be called on and they do not need to use the raised hand function. Uh, we'll, we will call on them to testify. Um, I would next like to call on Aziz Ba. Aziz. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chairman. My name's uh, Aziz Ba. I'm the uh, um, I'm a driver and uh, um, organizing director of the Independent Drivers Guild. And I'm uh, going to deliver this um, uh, testimony from uh, Brandon Sexton, who is the executive director, but couldn't make it here um, today. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have been uh, through some tough times, to say the least. Over the last seven plus months and counting, drivers across all industry sectors, FHV medallion and liveries, are some of the true unsung hero of this crisis. A majority of our 80,000 drivers were out of work for a month and many still are. New York State DOL mishandled thousands of pandemic unemployment assistance claim, leaving our drivers stand, stranded for a month without, with mounting bills and no way to support their families. Some remain on the job, making that as little as they could, you know, shutting doors, 
um, shuttling door doctors, nurses, and other essential workers to and from work. Others delivered meal to those in need. So for a while, we did not have the needed support and protection, PPE, cleaning supplies, dividers. We all were given confusing advices and directions from all level of government. Drivers were afraid to go to doctors or emergency rooms because they lack health insurance. Some drivers got sick, some drivers died. Some have and continue to suffer from depression, anxiety, and other mental disorder. Many drivers have been financially devastated, have simply left the industry, filed for bankruptcy, or the brinks of doing so. From the very beginning of this crisis, drivers should have been given the PPEs and supplies by the city and app companies. From the very beginning, drivers should have been told two minutes for the city hospitals free of charge for tests and treatment. From the very beginning, drivers should have been massively enrolled in their free benefits. So I want to um, thank the commissioner and her TLC team. They were accessible to us and uh, uh, throughout this entire crisis. Um, I believe they did, they could, you know, uh, they, they, they fell into a very complicated situ uh, situation, complicated circumstances and trying to do the best they could. But IDG recognized quickly the ability, the inability of inter institution to acquire and dis distribute PPEs for the drivers. PPE supplies were scarce and overpriced. In partnership with the Black Coffin, we filled the void and were able to pack and distribute over 20,000 PPE kits to all drivers, including FHV liveries and taxi workers. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, may I continue with my uh, own statement, if you allow me? Time is starting now. Again, my name is um, Aziz Ba. Um, good afternoon. Um, if there is anything unique about New York, is that that's the city that never sleeps. The devastating reality of the pandemic brought that to a screeching halt. All of the familiar vehicles rolling down streets and avenues, taking New Yorkers where they need to go, were all off the road. They were parked. After the first month went by without driving, every driver turned to us with the same question. Are we still going to keep paying high insurance costs even though we were not driving? The answer couldn't be more complicated. The pandemic in New York on post have dramatically reduced FHV business, traffic, car accident, and accident claims, creating a windfall in saving and profit for insurers. However, the insurance companies did not reduce premium for drivers. FHV drivers pay an average of $350 per month or more for insurance for the risk associated with our work. We should not have to pay for coverage when we are not working or our work has been significantly reduced, especially when it is due to no fault of our own. So the answer should be simple, right? I thought so, but the governor moratorium on payment deferral went into effect at the end of March. It didn't help much because drivers still have to pay higher monthly premium for the next 12 months. For the majority of drivers who have been basically out of work for six months, that's a burden of over $2,000 for six months of insurance when we, couldn't, when we couldn't even work. So with the uncertainty of the industry, which lost over 80% 80, 80 of daily trips. It's hard to predict when things will get back to pre-pandemic levels. I'm expired. But making a living again. Then came the TLC license storage program designed to allow drivers to store their vehicle plates for initially 90 days and later extended to 180. I would like to thank the commissioner again for taking the steps to address the burden on drivers, but the complications ranging from insurance brokers requiring mandatory plate surrender making it impossible to park the plateless vehicles on the streets, to holding portions of monies from drivers that had already paid their policies in full, 
and not to mention like DLC rules having um, not much to do with the storage program at all, left drivers in limbo. Time expired. Ten, ten more seconds, please. There must be a simpler approach to get to the simple answer. Drivers are looking forward to common sense measure that will help us avoid bankruptcy and be able to continue serving this city. When the city needs drivers, we always answer the call. The, this time, we need assistance in fixing the very unfair insurance regulation that are stacked up against us. So Chairman Rodriguez, members of the Transportation Committee, and uh, Commissioner Jamozuk, we are asking you all to come to the rescue of drivers with regard to high insurance costs by providing the simple answer drivers are waiting for. Drivers give yes. life to New Yorkers and visitors. And while the industry is down due to the pandemic, our immigrant community should not be taken for a ride. So the IDG has a petition signed by 11. Sorry, your time is up. And please take a look at that, uh, 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 into it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Aziz, and for reading Brendan Sexton's testimony as well. Are there any questions for this panelist? OK, seeing none, our next panelist will be Jen Hensley. Jen? Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Jen Hensley, uh, Senior Director of Policy at Lyft, and I wanted to share today some of the ways uh, that Lyft has worked with the TLC to respond to the needs and changes related to COVID-19. Lyft was very pleased when in early May in response to the challenges posed by the pandemic, the TLC announced a temporary expansion of their partition program. We know that partitions um, can make riders feel safer and make them more willing to utilize ride share at a time when demand was uh, extremely low and challenged. So this create, would create more ride opportunities for drivers. Um, we quickly submitted an application to become an official TLC approved installer of partitions, um, sourced products and developed installation procedures in accordance with the rules and guidelines. Um, and today, any driver on the Lyft platform can make an appointment for a free partition and a free installation at our driver center in Long Island City. To our knowledge, we're the only installer to have offered completely um, free partitions and installations during this time. And we're seeing hundreds of drivers a week and very positive reviews overall for the service. We also provide all Lyft drivers free deep, clean, deep car cleanings at our driver center. And of course, PPE, PPE kits with sanitizers and masks. Lyft was also happy to spread the word to our drivers about the TLC's driver assistance program, which you heard so much about earlier today. Um, because that program was administered by the city, we don't actually know how many of our drivers participated or what their earnings were, um, but we do know that we also partnered with dozens of other nonprofit organizations locally to offer ride credits to be shared with those in most in need, equally helping the community and providing a boost uh, in rides to drivers who are still out on the road. We know that these have had a tremendous positive impact on organizations like the Asian American Federation. I'm expired. The Met Council and others, and we've submitted our full written testimony uh, for the committee's review. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Jason Gross. Jason? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Jason Gross, and I'm vice president of mobile at Curb. We wanted to take this opportunity to commend TLC Commissioner Jarmashuk and the entire TLC staff for their tireless work to support not only licensed taxi drivers, but also the essential workers and other residents of New York City during the COVID pandemic. Beginning with an initial late night call in mid-March, the TLC has routinely and proactively reached out to a variety of stakeholders throughout the transportation industry to see how the TLC can help connect city agencies and other organizations in need of transportation with drivers in need of income during this extremely challenging time for the transportation industry. At Curb, we are proud to have been one of those to answer the calls, both figuratively and literally. The list of agencies we've been able to assist with the Curb app, web platform, and 24-7 call center is long and still growing daily. From the Department of Homeless Services, the Department of Corrections, and the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice, to New York City Health and Hospitals, the Board of Elections, the Department of Education, and many others. 
the outcomes have been both rewarding and impressive. To date, yellow taxi drivers, green street hail livery drivers, and black car drivers on the Curb app and platform have completed over half a million trips on behalf of city and state agencies, the transport doctors, nurses, hospital staff, and other essential workers, as well as vulnerable residents and visitors during the pandemic. This has generated millions of dollars in much needed income for thousands of drivers over the past seven months, not to mention supporting the hardworking employees here at Curb and our families. Although we represent only one part of a much larger effort by the commissioner and her staff at the TLC, we are thankful for the opportunity to help and we are truly amazed by the persistence and dedication of the drivers who have risked their lives day in and day out to keep our city moving. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do we have any questions for those panelists? How many, how many bases, local bases are part of those uh, groups that you were able uh, to partner with? Um, so I can't give you a count of bases, Councilman, on, uh, at this moment. What I can tell you is with respect to livery bases, we've been working under our e-hail license with, through which we work with green street hail liveries. So I can, if, you at, if you'd like, uh, get you guys a count of the bases with which those vehicles are associated. So let's see how we can follow up, you know, outside, you know, the hearing right now to see how we can share more details because, you know, for me, I, I do believe also it is important for the local bases to be partnered with institutions that they can provide, you know, the infrastructure that they need to, to be connected with the opportunity. But at the same time, everything is local. So when sure. I'm being a former driver in the 80s, knowing that when there's a, you know, a request for proposal, it's sometimes the local one, they are not the one that are in the better position to respond. So it, I feel that, you know, I appreciate anyone that play a role, you know, in, in responding to any need that we have as a city. But I also think that it is important also to look on how to expand opportunity to local bases that connect drivers that they been providing their services in underserved communities? Um, we are very happy to do that. We have an open door policy and we are you know, happy and willing to work with any drive, licensed TLC driver who wishes to be on the platform. I just, well, I just think that whoever, and I don't question because you know it, it's the first time that we're talking right now on this, so I don't want to start having any doubt of the intention, but I feel that uh, in this period of time, I always say that the coronavirus and George, the George Floyd you know, put a face of the student journey into equity, lack of access. And I think that, you know, we have seen academic, cultural, any private sectors about we have open door, but the question is, do we go extra mile, you know, to, to connect with the local bases, those who were there, when we have 125 homicide in the Northern Manhattan, the same thing in the Bronx, so that they also can share the opportunity the benefits. So more than happy to continue, you know, to contact with you to see what opportunity are there in a process that, you know, is you guys who are leading these uh, services that you've been able to, to provide by, you know, connecting opportunity to the local one. That, that is our business model. So we would appreciate the opportunity to follow up with you on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions for this panelist, uh, we will move on to the next panelist. Uh, and I, I apologize for mispronunciation of, of anyone's name. Uh, ne the next panelist will be Suvez Bairagi. Time starts now. Mr. Bairagi, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Mr. Baragi, could you unmute yourself? You have to turn on your microphone. <clears throat> Good. 
Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes, time starts uh, now. Oh, sorry for that. Um, hi, good afternoon, Chairman and everybody. Thank you for inviting uh, for testimony. I am Shubesh Bairagi, medallion owner. Um, my medallion number is 4W31. I bought it 2014, last auction. Price was 851 something. I paid 100,000, but all the money from loan, some of money uh, from my life insurance, some of, my, uh, some of my friend's money. This money I gave to city via my broker, Omega. I paid 3,900 monthly mortgage up to three years, 2014 to 2017. Next three years, um, I paid 3,200, 2017 to 2019. And now I am paying um, 2,063 dollar, 2019 to 2020. I paid work and comp, I paid insurance. I lost my money, I lost my health, I lost my family peace. I lost everything. So I am requesting to Zas that give me my money back. I am member of Taxi Worker Alliance. I explained my pain to my leader, Bhairavi Desai. You will know details from her. This is accessible medallion. I have no driver. For a long time, I am driving alone. So I am very, very sick. On the other hand, 19, COVID-19, my family very afraid to me. I'm expired. I, I, I cannot go to work right now. How long this situation, I don't know. Nobody knows. So please give us a day forgiveness now. Help me and to help my family. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, does anyone have a question for this panelist? Okay, uh, our, our next panelist will be Gerson Fernandez. Time starts now. Hello, you can hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm a yellow taxi medallion owner. I'm 66 years old. The last four years, I'm not able to make my payments properly. But of course, I paid them on time and always, what do you call that, automatic. But it's becoming very difficult. So I would just ask the city council if it's possible. I know it's difficult. And especially what Ms. Desai has proposed, if you could make it 125,000 where we pay 750 a month, this way it becomes practical, not only to me, maybe to the other medallion owners too. That's all I'm asking. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Do we have any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the next panelist. Our, our next panelist will be Mohammed Mabab. Time starts now. Hello. You hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, you can? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking me and thank you uh, for taking my call. Uh, I uh, uh, pay my respect to the, uh, uh, the, the chairman of transportation committee, Ian Rodriguez, and I pay my respect, Richie Torres, and I pay my respect, Chairwoman Colin, Chairwoman Andrea Adams, and 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 um, I pay my. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, say to my leader Boyrubi Deshai, uh, we really are protesting and all those fightings over the years, her leadership. And I thanks for her. And uh, I really uh, hear uh, the commissioner, TLC commissioners, uh, 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 
opinion about our driver. Uh, commissioner, really, I doubt it. Uh, he, she touched with the driver. Uh, that's all our cosmetic uh, advice. This is not real. It's not going to help the driver. I can tell you that. And uh, the all those rules comings, I hear it. I don't know. I don't have details. So um, all the rules have to be strictly uh, of, uh, uh, oversee, and everything have to be uh, very carefully uh, create because the broker bank. Uh, um, money managed company, uh, all those other interest group is very notorious. They, they, got, uh, uh, they kill us and they're going to kill again. So please uh, help us for the debt forgiveness and we'll be, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do we have any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next panelist will be Augustine Tang. Time Augustine. starts now. Hi, my name is Augustine Tang and I, I'm an owner driver and I inherited a medallion uh, as well as a loan for $530,000 after my father passed for five years ago. I ended up having to make a decision to move back in and take care of my 90 year old grandmother as well as juggling uh, having to learn about this industry. Uh, what I have learned is that this job is very lonely. Uh, when I first started, I crossed paths with uh, the late Kenny Chow, who was kind enough to answer questions I had about the job uh, and about the industry. Uh, he was hopeful in 2016 that the city will help medallion owners and that she shouldn't worry too much. Uh, he owed about 700,000 to Melrose. Um, he ended up committing suicide mid 2018. Before the pandemic, I wasn't, it, it wasn't easy to make uh, ends meet, uh, but I at least had a partner to help me support, uh, so, to help support me. Uh, you drive day after day as business had gotten worse and worse and traffic increasing more. Uh, it really takes a toll on the body and the mind. I started meeting older medallion owners who were more seasoned than I was uh, that would say, say to me, it used to be worth it to putting themselves through that. Uh, putting these long days week after week to be able to support uh, their families. And to be honest, the pandemic uh, gave me uh, just a little bit of time to breathe. Um, we got a chance to organize and luckily with Taxi Workers Alliance uh, kind of open our eyes about what kind of life we didn't want to go back to. Uh, we started sharing stories and hardships and uh, that was out of our control. It was, it was pretty cathartic to be honest. We knew it all came down to our city then we would, uh, to our city, we'll decide to do. Our lives uh, are predicated on how urgent and serious you take this crisis. Uh, we are tired. dying. Uh, just one more second. We are dying. Um, we just want our lives back. Um, please take a moment and review this well thought out proposal. Uh, it's a low risk for the city and will save many of my colleagues lives and families. Um, I think this is the only way we can survive. Um, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to our next panelist. Uh, our next panelist will be Richard Chow. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we, yes, can. we hear you. Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Richard Chow. Good afternoon, uh, Transportation Committee Chairman, Mr. Rodriguez and everyone. So I'm a driving for Yellow Cat for 15 years. I'm the owner driver. I'm also an NYT member. In 2018, Nine driver was committed suicide. One of my brother, Kenny Chow, or Yumin Chow was included. Because of the financial hardship, CD and TSE give allow to Uber, Lyft, and other apps to a little regulation to pick up all our fare. The yellow cap of very heavy regulation. That's why we lost the exclusive ride. And then we, I'm also, uh, 
I looked at the uh, uh, New York Times report that all the banks, the credit union, the preparatory lending default. That's a totally unacceptable, and this is made the crisis and unfair to the uh, Madonna owner. I'm also support to the New York State Attorney General to sue the New York City, so we lost our investment and the, our retirement. Madonna values should not be inflated by the banks or broker or credit union and the city. Backstop 200. 50,000 does not help us. We don't want to pay 250,000. We don't want to pay another extra 125,000 more than the principal than our plan. I have to pay 10 more years than the NYDA proposal. So Madonna value should be you know, directly related to the driver's income and you know, earning. During the pandemic time, no business, driver not enough making money to pay the Madonna mortgage and the expense. How do the right driver survive? Medallion value is only $70,000. Who want to buy the medallion? Pay 250000 especially the pandemic time. I am expired. Support, yeah, uh, give me one just second. And then we support New York and why did we propose a backstop of 125577 man pay um, uh, 4% fixed rate, 20-year per mortgage payment. And why did we propose a it's uh, like a very low cost to the CD and then very, uh, it's, uh, like a uh, very low risk. So, NY LAG driver resource centers under the, the mayor office, so they should be help us. No, no discourage us. So, we want, we want, we don't want an individual solution. We want the universal solution, one solution across all the crisis. 6,000 Madonna owner. So refinance take a five year to finish it. So, so we have to one solution we finish the crisis, we solve the crisis. And then we also mayor office. I was going to call the mayor office. So also the bank credit union, and then NYTWA, the city council attorney general bring it to the table, and then we solve the refinance. The, you know solve the crisis. So drivers, so we. We refuse to big up and the fight for the drive for goodness. So driver livable income and the survive. We want to solve this crisis as soon as possible and civilize it, the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, our next panelist will be Ashraf Ahmed. Ashraf. Time starts now. Hi, how are you doing, everybody? Uh, I'm a medallion owner. Uh, I came here to New York like uh, 25 years ago. Like any immigrant, I start as yellow cab driver, working hard 10 years, save all money I get it. And after that, I decide to buy a medallion. I put at this time like $125,000 down payment. Uh, the medallion was like 650. We're talking about 2011, 2010. So at this time, I still, uh, the Marvel get asking me like $460,000. I never did refinance. I never buy any house. I was working hard. I never stopped to make any payment the last uh, 11 years. Never stop, never uh, delay any payment. I would like to leave to my kids something it's gonna help them after I die. But now I am thinking, what I gonna leave to my kids when I die? Uh, even uh, I think they pushing me to do bankruptcy. Even the name, I keep it. Credit card was excellent still, so far excellent. But after bankruptcy, I leave to my kids what I gonna leave. I leave what? Bad name, bad credit uh, report, whatever I have. So who's gonna help? I imagine myself now, I walk in desert. And I study in high school, save our souls. When you leave, you're gonna leave, you're gonna see, you're gonna die. Boot sign SOS. We need someone, SOS uh, commissioner, uh, councils. We need some people working hard to help us, to uh, give us some hope. We sleep every night with bad dream. I said when I wake up, I need to cover my kids' cost. I have three kids, I have wife. I have to be good American person all my life until to die. 
Who's going to help us? I have no idea. The commissioner, the TLC commission said, oh, Marble Gate is give uh, some uh, good deals. I'm from expired. Six, I'm sorry, it's going to be a few seconds. It's going to give from 600 to 300. That's not enough. You know how is the market? You talk about 70,000. I have no driver to drive. I have nobody to help. So I am almost 52 years old. For how long I going to be like that? $2,000 payment a month. And I and the cost the cost is too high. Insurance, maintenance, the yellow cap is this is not fair competition. If you talk about the app, the company, the Uber or Lyft, whatever, the driver go an inspection once every two years. Yellow cap go once every four years, and you have to fix everything. You have to check everything. As the insurance is too high, our insurance seven thousand, eight thousand, the other. So who's gonna take care of this business and take care of six thousand family? Thank you for anyone is going to be with SOS. Save our souls. Please do something for us to keep us good American till we die. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Go ahead, Chair. A question. Uh, how much did you pay for your medallion? How much do you still owe right now? And, what is, and what is your monthly payment? Monthly payment two thousand hundred dollars. My loan like four hundred sixty thousand dollar. I buy the medallion six hundred fifty thousand uh, ten years eleven years ago. I never stop any payment. The Marble Gate contact me every two months. Come and pay twenty five thousand dollar, and we take your loan from from four hundred fifty four hundred sixty. We take it down to three hundred thousand. It's still three hundred thousand dollar. The payment is going to be 14, 1500 a month. That's with insurance, with uh, maintenance, with a lot of stuff. It's, it's too high. It's too high, especially if you have family, five people, and you are, you're only the one responsible about these people. That's too high money, too much. The, the competition is not uh, fair, sir. Uh, I'm sorry to talk about, but this is what happened since the city allowed the uh, app, the company work. The apps the companies they go for TLC inspection once every two months. Uh, I mean, once every two years. The taxi go every four. I have to go to check the seats, the tire, the brakes. The cost is too high to cover everything, especially if you drive by yourself. So the dream is going to be now bad dream. It's not good dream to own a medallion. Uh, it's, it's a very, very bad situation for anyone who own a medallion at this time. Yeah, we need we need to continue as you know, we've been working. I've been working with you guys to see, you know, how we can do the best we can to help. Uh, uh, I understand the situation. I'm not in your in your shoulder, but I know it's like we as a city also have responsibility because we sold, you know, to the medallion uh, uh, to those individuals that save the money and they get into the medallion that the yellow one were the only one that had exclusive to the pick up and drop out in any part of the city. So I get how we as a city have failed by also a, a, a allowing the high volume to come here. I just think that we need to think about, you know, how to put together the best plan, how to understand the reality that you and many other brothers and sisters are going through. And, and so, you know, my commitment to continue working with you, to continue working, pushing hard through this end will always be there. So let's see how, you know, we don't give up and, and let's try to also to put together a feasible plan that we can, that should be able to work to alleviate, you know, the financial crisis that you and many other I'm going through. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Mohammed Hussain. Mohammed. Time starts now. Hello. You hearing me, please? Yes, we Hello. hear you. Hi. My name is Mohammed S. Hussain. Uh, I have been taxi driver since 1998. I am my I am also the member of uh, New York Taxi Worker Alliance. I bought Medellin from the last auction 2014. 
bid price is uh, 400, uh, 840, uh, at 850, 400 grand. I invest here 133, 138 grand. My Maryland number 4W27. I don't have second driver forever because wheelchair accessible. My money under water, city sold my Maryland uh, to us and permission to work at company all uh, uh, at the same time. How is possible? I lost my health, my family is everything. City got my money. City has to back every single penny with interest. I don't need to Medellin, I have to my money back. I, I loan over 700 grand right now. Uh, why, um, uh, how, is, how, to, how, how I can support my family? I don't, I don't have any money, I don't want to die. I start, when I start driving uh, to buy uh, uh, for, uh, all X band after buy my Medellin is, uh, is almost six, almost $6,000 in uh, my expense, everything. Now I paid uh, over $2,000 every month. I pay uh, uh, all expense, including my mortgage insurance, everything. So I got a COVID-19. I need to live, I, I need to live. I don't want to drive. So I don't, this is my, all of money invest here. This is my, I would drive over 20 years. So I don't have nothing. So whatever I make the money, I invest here. So my money is, uh, is garbage. My life is garbage. So the, I'm expired. The, I uh, please help to me, dear chairman, commissioner, all of, all of them here, please help us. Especially who bought the Marilyn last auction. The, we lost everything. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next uh, panelist will be Mohammed Khan. Mohammed, time starts now. Do we have Mohammed? Okay, we can uh, move on to the next panelist and come back to Mohammed if, if we are able to reach him. Um, our next panelist will be Raul Rivera. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a TLC driver advocate. Can you, you guys hear me? Wait, hold on, hold on. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a New York City TLC driver advocate. I'm also a Families for Safe Streets member. I'm also a crash survivor. Uh, on May 13, 2020, we, we, we sent a letter to the commissioners, uh, LOC. We also sent uh, that same uh, email and letter to Chairman Rodriguez. It's, uh, it was pertaining the makeshift partitions. We wanted to ensure, because we didn't have no insurance from anyone, anyone, that drivers would receive uh, tickets for makeshift partitions. So we, we did a video, we shared it. Uh, we got no responses from Mr. Chairman Rodriguez. Elosi did response. Uh, also council member Kalina Rivera responded. And uh, we just wanna assure that the drivers that are working like myself who will never stop driving during the pandemic be protected and not receive tickets now and in the future. We need acknowledgement of that. If somebody creates a partition like I did for only $22, we cannot be held accountable by, uh, re by receiving tickets. It's shameful if we do receive. From what I understand, nobody's received tickets and that's great and it should remain that way. Drivers are using these makeshift partitions. A lot of them are not uh, TLC approved, but we cannot get no more tickets. Uh, and. I wanna say also, there's a big, big way to help the driver and it's a very simple way. If constituents reach out to your office, the best thing you could do to help them is to answer the emails. Mr. Rodriguez, we've sent a lot of emails, all due respect, and not answering the emails or your office. And some of the biggest offenders, Councilmember Deutsch. 
Time expired. Council member Debbie Rose. Big offenders, please respond to the constituent. We thank you for your time. God bless. Reform the TLC. Choferes Unidos. I agree with you, Raul. We need to continue again uh, looking at all the sector of this industry to see how we can help. A question, are you a Uber or are you a Liberty driver or yellow? I I am, thank you for the question, hey, saludos. Um, I'm, a, I'm a TLC driver, that's what we say. The license is the same. Taxi and no, right 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 the, the, the platform, the platform, the platform that I the platform that I use is Uber and Lyft. I have over seventeen thousand rides. I've been driving for five years. No, that's fine. That's one. I just wanted to you know to see because I think it is important that driver we get perspective of driving from all different sectors. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know. Let's say in in your case, you bring the perspective also from the Uber. You've been driving an Uber car, right? Uh, it's not an Uber car. It's because they don't own a car. It's a, it's a, I drive the platforms. Yes, I use the platforms. I use. Yeah, Lyft. but I said, but it's not a Uber car. It's no. an Uber car, right? It's, it's, I do, yes. I don't work through okay. the base. No, li no, no livery. But you know, okay. now that you bring up the question about livery, you know, I know the task force, we, it, it would be nice if I was put onto that task force. I'm really, I'm really a, a big advocate for the driver. And uh, I have an open mind, critical thinker, and I have a lot of supporters. It's, I think it's, uh, we reached yeah. out to Jumani. But what happened is, what happened, Raul, is that we need to then work on making any change of the task force because the task force is not for the high volume. The task force is for a, a delivery in, in, in black car, in the, in, the, in the family black car. So let's see how we can make any changes because so now as it is, it's not for this task force, it's only for the a small family block car and for the liver. So we can talk. A, a lot of a lot of livery drivers, they can't just work from the base. They're not getting the calls. So they supplement by using Uber and Lyft, which they're not supposed to, but it does happen, unfortunately. And uh, I I I I can I can't stress enough how I should be put onto that task force. I have a lot of input. I have over five years and 17,000 trips. I speak English and Spanish, and uh, that's all I can say. And I thank you for okay, the time. Then. Okay, thank you. Right. Right. We'll that's thank you. Um, do we have Mohammed Khan now? Mohammed? Time starts now. Okay, it sounds like we still don't have Mohammed. Uh, we can circle back to him. Um, our next panelist will be Osman Chowdhury. Osman? Time starts now. Hello, you hearing? Yes. Yeah, my name is Osman Chowdhury. I'm the Euro taxi driver driving the last 24 years. I have, uh, I have a concern about the unemployment insurance. What's going on now? New York State Labor. If I uh, allow, then like now I'm paying. I'm getting a two hundred dollar. I I will to work more three days. If I work three days, but one day they can account fifty dollars. And they say anybody work in the office, they are getting eight hours. But when we work twelve hours, we made it like a passenger time, like a two hours. And with every day I losing fifty dollars because uh, why gonna go people to work? If you don't get, you know, the sudden pass in the amount of work, that's why I need to change the law. If you, any taxi driver is going to work, like a passenger time, then they can report. Like, a, like a, I work three days, I make it like a six, six hours passenger time. And if you don't make this law, otherwise, if three days I work, every day get the state, New York State can cut up my $50 each day. And plus, if I work that time, like I made it one day, like a, 10 fear, I can pay the tax, it's a um, uh, conjunction price, state tax, all my, get us like a $30. What have I left my dear? And I and also I have to go to the garage, I have to work for the lease the car weekly, but if you don't have it, the weekly car, I have to pay $400. But I officially, I have to work three days, but I have four days left, I paid in the car. Even if you get a, if you get a car for a daily basis, but this is a risk for driver lives. That's why I need to change the state 
the any driver gonna work then gonna uh, passenger time gonna count otherwise we're not gonna work any driver not gonna go to work because this is the question and another thing uh, yellow taxi driver getting un, uh, unemployment insurance from the state like a uh, yellow taxi by 200 dollar uber now getting 500 dollars the, then getting the difference to here we pay uber monthly pay the your car insurance almost standard car thousand dollars a yellow cab driver pay in the garage almost three hundred thousand dollars every month gonna yellow driver ping but we get insurance Time expired. okay thank you very much thank you for your testimony our next panelist will be cooper sancho persad i'm starts now hello my name is Kuber Sancho Prasad. Thank you for allowing me to speak today and the city council. Thank you to the chair of the TLC commissioner and the uh, DOT. Uh, my dad, I, I'm a yellow cab driver for five years now. Uh, my dad was a yellow cab driver for 35 years. Uh, fortunately, he passed away in 2017 when um, he got the foreclosure notice for his medallion which he, uh, which he drove. Um, as I hear from my uh, brothers and sisters today in the cab industry, it's really suffering, but it's not only in the yellow cab, it's all throughout the industry. Well, I live in the Bronx where we have livery cab drivers and taxi drivers, where we have problems where livery cab drivers do pick up street hails and pick up uh, their base calls, right? But one thing that my dad always said is that everybody got to make a dollar. So I see that delivery cab is suffering because they have to pick up at whatever they can get. Uh, yellow cab is struggling. We cannot make our payments to uh, make our mortgage for our mortgages. And, and by that he lost his medallion because the broker had fallen behind on mortgage. And now he lost his medallion, the last thing he owned in the city. He put, he had faith in the city that the city would bring back his medallion and, and he would uh, have something we're tied to, but he ended up passing away and becoming depressed when his medallion became foreclosed on. Um, he owed about $600,000. Um, I would like to see that maybe all these drivers could get their money back because they put their faith into the city. I had a dream of driving at the American dream of owning something and being a part of the city that they loved. And the city has portrayed them and sold their dreams away. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, now we'll call one more time on Mohammed Khan. Mohammed. Seems like we've lost him again. Okay, our next panelist will be Valentin Georgiev. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, my story is the same as uh, most of the people that uh, testified came here to America looking for a better life, uh, started driving a cab since 92, and then uh, continue working hard to support my family, I have a son, and um, uh, then I got uh, sold by the idea that uh, uh, it's a, a good deal to um, buy a medallion, city medallion, taxi medallion, and um, uh, by uh, doing that, providing for a family, providing uh, yourself with a job, and uh, providing and um, uh, providing yourself with a business, which is the ultimate American dream. Um, everything was uh, going well. I mean, I was working almost 24 hours a day until the city betrayed us and sold the uh, rights to uh, picking up uh, people on the street to uh, to the app companies which uh, abused uh, the drivers and um, um, ripped off the customers, uh, uh, refusing to provide anything to the drivers, pensions, uh, healthcare, uh, anything, just ripping off uh, everybody and uh, just collecting the money that we, all, that, that we already paid to the city, millions of dollars. And um, actually the city made during Giuliani and uh, Bloomberg 
billions of dollars. And now it's kind of hypocritical to say, oh, we have no money to help you, even though we already sold you uh, the medallions that uh, uh, helped us uh, managing our budgets, providing money for the uh, teachers, for the uh, cops, and for the firefighters. But now money is gone, and so I'm myself. Uh, thank you very much. Just a couple more seconds. So I'm also a member of the um, Taxi Alliance and completely agree with their uh, stand that we need to bring down the, the loans of everybody to 125,000 and uh, seven, um, 750 a month, which is uh, the most reasonable um, um, bringing to the end the, the most reasonable solution of this big problem. Um, that's all I can say. Thanks for your attention. Have a nice day. Thank you for your testimony. Um, if there are no questions for this panelist, our next panelist will be Ricardo Lopez. Ricardo? Time starts now. Ricardo? Okay, it seems like we don't have Ricardo, so our, our next panelist will be Erhan Tunsell. Time starts now. Erhan? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation. My name is Erhan Tunjal. Uh, I'm a yellow taxi owner driver and a proud member of uh, New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Um, we all know these facts. The yellow taxi industry buckled under because of the pressure from unfair competition that rideshare companies imposed on us. New York City and New York State regulators allowed these app companies to enter the for hire vehicle industry with little or no regulations and expected heavily regulated yellow industry to be able to compete. TLT's band-aid approaches have been just that, band-aids to a heavily bleeding wound. I'm not just testifying today to beat the drums of anger many owner drivers feel. I'm testifying to remind you that you have the power to make a difference today. You have the power to stabilize the yellow taxi industry by helping us. Owner drivers get what we so desperately need, loan forgiveness. The owner driver's ability to make a decent, respectable living from a very hard and challenging work has always been in direct correlation with the stability of the taxi industry. We cannot have stability for the yellow taxi industry without restoring the dignity that's been lost, that's been stolen from the owner drivers. We have lost our ability to provide for our families, to send our kids to college, to retire with dignity after many decades of service. We have lost for many our only lifetime investment. We have lost all that because you stood by and did absolutely nothing when it mattered the most. Unfair competition from right here and weakened us. Time and COVID-19 COVID put all but the last nail in our coffins. The last nail, you may ask, and that would be, that last nail will be your indifference to our needs. It's time for you to act now. There are a few options floating around for your consideration. I strongly urge you to consider the well thought out proposal by the New York Taxi Workers Alliance because it has the best chance to stabilize the taxi industry by giving owner drivers back the ability to provide for our families at pre ride share levels. This proposal is essential to stabilize the taxi industry and resolve our indis undisputable hardship under today's conditions. Other proposals are lacking serious conviction. As, as their numbers are surely going to enslave us to land us green Time is expired. once again for many decades to come. Thank you for testifying. Allow me to testify today. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we have also been joined by Council Member Levin. Um, our next panelist will be Chime Gyatso. Time starts now. We have this panelist. Okay, um, we don't have time. Uh, our next panelist will be Galena Kamiker. Time starts now. Uh, hi, my name is Galena Kamenker and I come from the family of medallion owners drivers. My husband is a driver owner, I'm a owner, and um, I just, you know, all of us have been talking here about um, loan forgiveness and that's a must. I don't think we're asking, I think we are requesting this, but this is just the beginning because once loan is forgiven, how do we operate after that? How do industry get re reinstated to the way it was because we will we were promised exclusive rights to pick up within certain areas. I'm not against apps, uh, Ubers. There are plenty of opportunities for them to do outside the central business areas. But if we are not getting the exclusive rights to that, we are gone. Even if with the loan forgiveness, partial, we still have to pay out thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to the banks. And, um, you know, what we've been uh, offered, mental health, we're not mental health people. We are stable, we are proud people, we are being offered public assistance, help with um, paying our loans, which, you know, we, we didn't come here for this. We came here to have our own faith, our own dignity, and not to go with uh, public assistance, food stamps. We never asked for it. When we came here, we never went for this, and I'm not going for that either. Mental health with stable people. But if the city doesn't do anything without um, making us as a monopoly. I'm not afraid to say that. It is we have to be in the monopoly because we invested in the city and the city has an opportunity to continue this industry and providing a lot of money to the city. The yellow cat is not going away, but you're gonna kill everybody who owns the cat now. So does the city can afford to have 6,000 deaths on its hands with families? That's a question that I have to you council members. Plus you also have to think about it are you allowing Uber and Lyft to, to, to work without a license? All of a sudden, the license got approved with their environmental I'm expired. I, I have a few more seconds because I don't think you have a lot of people on this call. All those questions been, we've been asking Chairman uh, Alois, she's, she, she honestly, I have to say, I mean, we have a lot of disagreements, but she's the only one who agreed to talk to us, even though a chairman, due to your respect, I don't see any improvements from where we are six months ago to where we are now and we are in in the crisis now we were in the crisis before pandemic pandemic killed us it's killing us if we're not going to make any money if we're going to thrive 12 120 thousand ubers against 13 thousand yellows six you know that there are about nine thousand yellows on the shelf in tlc that means we cannot make any money Yes, we're going to get a loan forgiveness for what? I cannot pay $1,000. I cannot pay $700 a month. People who are unemployment making $180 a week, how, you, how can you pay $1,000? So, I mean, city has an obligation. Either you're going to have 6,000 deaths on your hands. I mean, are you able to face that? How can you look at people's eyes and say you killed your parents? So there is, has to be a way for you to think broader than that. Plus, if you're going to revive you our business. industry, you're going to bring income to the city because the city needs money now. I'm not asking for the city money. I'm asking to give us jobs that we can pay to TLC because we're supporting TLC. We're supporting city. Without Yellow, you guys Thank are also going to be out of jobs. You need to testify. Thanks. Our next uh, panelist will be sure. Eugene Pema. Time starts now. Hello. <clears throat> Thanks for taking my call. Um, my name is Eugen Pema. Uh, I've been uh, 
driving taxi for a long period of time. And, um, and I finally uh, trusted uh, the city, state, and TLC. And I bought a taxi medallion for thousands of dollars. And, um, and then uh, the corporate company uh, like uh, Uber and Lyft came and they ruined our business. And on top of that, um, the state, uh, Governor Como, imposed us uh, the surcharge 250. And after that, it's completely ruined. And now we have a huge debt. You know, uh, we cannot be able to pay. Uh, we're supposed to. I mean, we're supposed to have the exclusive right to hail in the most of the most of the city, the city and. And TLC uh, should oversee and regulate the financial stability of Medan market, but they failed to do so. <clears throat> so right now, so we we are asking, uh, we are in, uh, we don't have income. Uh, we request to forgive our debt, you know, and let us live. Uh, we are the only one who always serve the city, and return on the return. Um, we are suffering right now. So uh, I have uh, like two children who are, uh, one is uh, already in college, first year in college. One is about to go to high school. Uh, I saved this money for uh, my uh, my family and uh, my children. Now we cannot afford that. So please help us, help us to live. Uh, I dreamt the American dream, but the dream is now for I'm off. Tired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our next panelist will be M.D. Kadir. Time starts now. Do we have this panelist? Okay, um, if not, um, our next panelist will be Nippon Dr. Oh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name Chime, hold on one moment, please. Pardon me? We can hear from him at this time. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is uh, Purva Rama. I am an individual uh, medal in order and a uh, COVID-19 survivor. Uh, my medal in was once an African dream, and now it is a big burden. After the arrival of F company, yellow business went down very badly, and now due to the COVID-19. It's completely destroyed. For me, it's nightmare. I lost my drivers, and I'm suffering from uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, and poor sleep. I have weak loan, around $500,000, and monthly mortgage is $3,152. I discontinued my payment since March 2020 due to the uh, no income. My car is parked in the street since March 2020. I, I request to be, I request to lower my debt to uh, $125,000 and rest forgiveness. And 4% interest for 20 years, uh, only then I can survive. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. Could you say your name for the record, please? Uh, my name is Purva Lama. And I, I bought my medallion in 2008. Thank Can you. I talk more? Thank you for your testimony. And uh, for $500,000. And I paid to sell tax to the city $25,000. And I am a victim of predatory loan. Time expires. At that time, when I bought my medallion, I had only $18,000 in my bank account. 
how come they gave me loan for five hundred thousand dollars? I borrow sixty nine thousand uh sixty nine thousand dollars uh, no sixty three thousand nine hundred dollars from my uh, brother and I use my credit card twenty five thousand dollars this way I bought my uh, now now I feel like I'm a victim of credit loan so yeah. Thank you for your testimony. You're so this way. Expired. Our next panelist will be Dipan Das. Time starts now. Dipan. <laughs> You're not going to do very clear. We're having trouble understanding you. Could you? Your volume seems to be low. Okay, uh, it seems like we may have lost him. Um, at this time, are there any other panelists that we have not called on? If you could use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, um, it seems this may be the end of our list of public testimony. Chair Rodriguez. Yeah, with that, thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Evelyn Collado, who also is my legislation director and the whole team on all the participants uh, for being this hearing. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. And as a reminder, you can submit testimony for the record if you are unable to speak today.